Welcome back friends. In this video, we shall go to discuss about the ionic or electrovalent bond and metallic bond. Stay with me up to the last point and then if you don't understand anything, you may ask the question in the comments below and then I will see the way of answering your questions. So now, as I told you in my previous videos, we discussed about the covalent bonds and about the properties of the covalent bonds, types of the covalent bonds, and different aspects about the covalent bonds, and how the questions are asked and can be tackled from each type of the covalent bond. So now let's go direct to discuss about the electrovalent bond. So as we discussed in the covalent bond, that covalent bond is formed by the shell of electron. And that shell of electron, as we said earlier, that it can be between the atoms having the the same electronegativity forming the nonpolar covalent bond, or can be between the atoms having different electronegativity forming polar covalent bond, or the shared electron can be donated by one atom forming the dative or the coordinate covalent bond. But in this video now we are going about we are going to look about the ionic bond or electrovalent bond. Electrovalent bond now is formed by the donation of the electron. So one atom donates electron and another atom receives electron. Or simply we say electrovalent bond is the type of chemical bond which are formed by the transfer of electron from one atom to another. That is to say which is formed by the transfer of electron from the by the transfer of electrons from the metallic element or from the less electronegative atom to the more electronegative atom. Not by the attraction, it is transfer, actual transfer of the electrons. So electrovalent bond or ionic bond is electrostatic force of attraction between oppositely charged ions. Oppositely charged ions. So why are they oppositely charged? Now, take an example of sodium sodium fluoride i am just taking these examples which are which are normal and everybody can can understand them so taking sodium fluoride taking sodium fluoride now here we are using just the O level electronic configuration sodium will appear as as this is an 11th element so sodium will appear as 2 then 8 then 1 and the fluorine will appear as 2 then 7. So here what happens is that in sodium we will have electronic configuration appearing like this. 80 appearing like this. And then we will have one electron. This is the outermost electron in sodium. And then in fluorine, we'll have electronic configuration appearing like this. Or let's say in fluorine, let's draw electrons in dots. So electronic configuration will appear like this. So fluorine here has one atom of electron. As I mean, has seven atomic electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And sodium here has one atomic electron. And as I told you before, that the aim of chemical bonding is to attain stability. So if the aim is to attain stability, here, as you can see in our example, this can attain stability by gaining electron and can have its octet state. Octet means it has eight electrons in the atomic shell. And even this can gain stability by losing this electron and it will have octet state. Because if it will lose this electron, then what will happen is that this outermost shell will be removed and then the outermost shell will be this one. So here sodium transfer its electrons. Transfer its electron. It donates electron to fluorine. And what will happen in the sodium fluoride? As it happened as a bond, so in the sodium fluoride here, sodium fluoride, it will, it will appear as, in sodium fluoride, it will appear as sodium, 
then we shall have this, then we shall have 8 electrons, and then we shall have this, and here is where it bonds with chlorine, so we shall have this, then we will have, we'll have this. So, sodium here has the doublet state because the outermost shell now has, has transferred this electron to fluorine and then the outermost shell of sodium has two electrons. But the outermost shell of fluorine now, it has 80 electrons as you can see here. So, when this sodium, when this sodium, it donates electron, it becomes positively charged. When this sodium donates electrons, it becomes positively charged. So here, the transfer of this electron, we call this sodium to become positively charged. And here, the gain of this electron, we call it for it to become negatively charged. And that's what, why we say that this compound will be neutral like this because the positive charge in the sodium will cancel with the negative charge in the fluorine. So the positive charge is formed by losing electron and the negative charge is formed by the gaining of the electrons. So during formation of the ionic bonds, the one of the element must donate electron and the element which donates electron is a metal and another element should receive electron which is the non-metal. So a metal donates electron where the nanometer receives electron. And in that, in that fact, they form the force of attraction or the strong bond between them, which is called the electrovalent, the electrovalent or the ionic bond. So the bond which is formed by transfer of electron, it occurs between atoms of metal and nanometers. The metal donated electron, while the nanometer gain the donated electron from the from the to form the negative ion. And now from there, let's go to see about the formation. As I have illustrated to you the formation of the of the ionic bond like like this. So I don't think if there is a need to repeat it again. However, in the notes they 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 just put another example of the magnesium oxide. But the what happens in the solution is the same. I've just taken the example of the sodium chloride and this transfer of electron and even in the magnesium oxide and even other other compounds what happens is the same. So now let's simply see about the properties of the electrovalent or ionic bond. So firstly they are solved in water. Why are they solved? Because these are polar. They are polar. So being polar, water also is the polar molecule, and the polar dissolved polar, so that's why they are always solved in water. Or sometimes you can explain solubility in terms of formation of the hydrogen bonds with water. And I just invite you to see my next video when I will be discussing with the hydrogen bonds and how are they, are they affecting different properties of water. So if these, if these compounds have the bit of forming the hydrogen bonds with the water, they, they become soluble in, in water. And then the second property, they are good conductor for heat and electricity when in a molten solution. This is because in a molten solution, they have free electrons. And the electrons can act as the carrier of energy. So electricity is energy, heat is the energy. The free electrons in the molten state are the ones which allow the conduction of the any kind of energy maybe electrical energy or heat energy because all of these energy they are transferred by the movement of the electrons electrons they move from one point and they collide with other electrons to other points and hence they result into the into the transfer of energy according to the to the kinetic theory of of matter and the third thing is that they are formed by the transfer of electrons. The fourth property, they have high melting and boiling point. That is because of the high force of attraction between the two atoms. And that is simply because of the difference in the electronegativity of the atom, the electronegativity of sodium, or the electronegativity of a metal 
is very small as compared to the electronegativity of the nanometer. So because nanometers are usually has high electronegativity, the difference between metals and nanometer electronegativity is very wide. And that wider difference in electronegativity lead to the fact that these atoms form the very strong bond. And they are crystalline solids in nature, such as salts, they appear as crystalline, crystal. So the last property is that ionic bond get broken when the substance is dissolved in a polar solvent. So let's say it is sodium chloride or sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is the normal salt which we are eating daily. So sodium chloride, when it is dissolved in water, it is broken down into sodium and chlorine ions. So in water, it does not happen or it does not exist at the sodium. It dissolves or it dissociates in water. Now that's the end on, on the ionic bond. And let's go to discuss about the metallic bond. Now what is a metallic bond? Metallic bond, we say simply, in the force of attraction which hold together the metal atoms or alloys. So in metals, as you can see different metals such as aluminium, copper, magnesium, sodium. In alloys, maybe in aluminium, as you can see these electrical wires, electrical cables used by the electrical companies to supply electricity in houses. They are made by the alloys. Alloys means the it is written as alloys. Alloys means it is the mixture of the different different metals, and that mixture is done in order to emphasize a certain property. So maybe we may form aluminium alloy, maybe for making the electrical conductors and etc. So they are in the alloys. What holds the metal atoms together? Because there we have no nanometer. So we can't say it is ionic bond which holds the metal atoms together. And if we don't have any bond, why are they holding together? So you must be the one which question yourself. What holds together things? What holds together the things maybe in this what holds together atoms in this compound? Because in every substance you see, we have the smallest, smallest structure making a matter, which is an atom. So what holds together the atoms of these elements? What holds together the atoms, I mean, of this substance? Maybe it is a conductor. What holds together the atoms of that conductor? So now, in these metallic compounds, what happens is that the bonds is formed by neither the transfer or the gain of electron, nor the sharing. So it is not a transfer, it is not gain, it is not sharing of electron. It is different from other types of bonds. So what happens here is that, so let's say we have, we have a metallic substance like this. This is our metallic substance. And then in this metallic substance, Let's say we have positive ions. Let's say it is aluminium. So we may have aluminium, 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 aluminium. And these are just examples. So they are not six, they are many. They are millions. So this aluminium, as we know that they have small electronegativity, so they have the ability to just release the electron and let them flee in that metallic object. So the electrons from aluminium, they, they exist as free electrons in the metallic arm. That's why I told you that it is not done by the transfer of electrons. So aluminium, they lose the electron, but it is not by the transfer to a certain element because here no element which can receive electron, no nanometer in this conductor. So these electrons are the ones which are conducting electricity or heat in the metallic objects. Now, if the aluminium loses the electrons 
to this. This is what we call uh, the pool of electrons. The pool of electrons or delocalized electrons. These electrons, they are called delocalized. Delocalized electrons. D simply means have no. So delocalized means electrons with no location. Or they are free electrons. And this space is what we can call we can call it the pool of electrons. So it is the pool of electrons. So the electrons are released from aluminium into the pool of electrons. The pool of, of electrons contain the localized or free electrons. And as I told you that these electrons are the ones which are responsible for the transfer of electrical energy or of the heat energy. So now, what happens here is that as aluminium loses the electron, they become negatively charged. So each aluminium atom here, each aluminium atom, I mean it, they become positively, not negatively. Each aluminium atom here is positively charged. And remember the electrons, they are negatively charged. So the, the, there will be the force of attraction between the positively charged aluminium atom and the negatively charged electrons. And this force of attraction is what will cause the metallic bond to occur. So metallic bond is the result of the force of attraction between the delocalized electrons and the metallic atoms in that metallic substance. So here we have the, the C model of the metallic structure. In solid metals, the valence electrons of each atom are free to move around all the atoms. They are free to move around. So the out, out electrons from a, a general pool, which is often called a sea of electrons or pool of electrons, the atoms remain neutral, but the electrons are free. So the atoms remain neutral, but the, the electrons are free. So here, actually, it's not the atoms remain neutral. The atoms actually they become cut ions. Because when the electrons, outermost electrons, are free, simply that will mean that the, the electrons become... Okay, anyway, even if the atoms are neutral, but the attraction between the atoms and the electrons is what forms the, the metallic bond. So the attraction between the, the atoms, metallic atoms and the electrons is what forms the atomic bond. So... Later, I wish you nice studies. In the next lecture, we shall discuss about the intermolecular forces. Intermolecular. These, what we discussed, them, they were, they were intramolecular. Simply, intra means within molecule. But in the next lecture, we shall discuss intermolecular, between molecules. So, for example, here, intramolecular when we are seeing hydrogen chloride the bond between hydrogen and chlorine we know it is the polar covalent bond but in intramolecular we want to know the bond between one hydrogen chloride and another hydrogen chloride what kind of bond can it be so let us wish you nice studies and then we shall meet in the next lecture for the intramolecular forces and for any comment subscribe the channel for any comment for any question you can just ask me thank you